maybe our assumptions about the necessity of overwork, the constant pressure of deadlines always at your back. Maybe our assumptions that we need that in order to do really good work. Maybe that's actually completely backwards. Maybe in order to do the kind of work that we really want to do, it's necessary to pay more attention to how we rest. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks very much. It's great to be with you. Yeah, look, I have been looking forward to speaking to you ever since I read your first book. Well, the first book of yours that I've read, which is called Rest, which I think I read in about 2017. Yeah. Um, something like that. Okay. Really, really enjoyed it. I know we've interacted a bit on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And um, when I saw that your new book was coming out, Shorter, uh, all about how working less could get more done. I thought, okay, I hope he's in London soon to actually do some PR. Then I can actually grab you and talk to you. So thanks for coming on. Yeah. No. So first question for me is, how's London been so far? Uh, it's been great. Um, and I will confess, I am one of, uh, I'm a huge Anglophile. I did a dissertation on Victorian science. So I've been coming here for a long time. So it's always great to be back. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, anything you do in particular when you get to London? You know, um, usually I'm here for work. So, you know, the days are spent doing workshops or consulting or what have you. So my, most of my free time is in the evening and I take my camera and go out walking and London is a fantastic place for just, you know, turning a corner and discovering some, you know, yeah. brilliant little square or beautiful street. So, um, that's usually what I do. I mean, that's super interesting, Alex, because that in many ways plays into, what you write about. Mm -hmm. um, you write about rest. You write specifically about deliberate rest. And, you know, I know from myself when doing book promotion and you're on book tours, it is full on and mm -hmm. hectic. And you can be go, go, go from right the start of the day to the end of the day, interviews, um, talks, workshops, whatever it is, which mm -hmm. is fun. And obviously, we're very fortunate to have that opportunity. But I know this year with my third book, I have actually been very proactive about putting deliberate rest into my days. Mm -hmm. because it's something I probably didn't do on previous book tours. And it sounds like photography in the evening for you, in some ways, is your way of counterbalancing all the work stress in the day. Is that fair to say? Um, we can finish now because that's exactly right. You've pretty much summed up the, or the, the argument of, of rest. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that we often underestimate is the value of that kind of that kind of activity and that kind of you know active rest in helping us make sense of the day you know or of uh, or to process ideas um, have new ideas and you know kind of generally make sense of our lives right and one of the things I talk about in the book is um, sort of the importance of what I call deep play, like serious hobbies for people. So, um, you know, whether you are this, you know, this can be anything from, you know, painting as it was for Winston Churchill to mountain climbing to, you know, other sorts of sports or, you know, or, or chess or, you know, or, or, um, my wife is a serious quilter. And these, you know, one of the things that deep play does is it offers an all, offers a lot of the same pleasures of our of our work in a very different kind of context. You know, one of the things you talk about in or in your in your latest book is how um, building healthy habits on top of on top of existing practices is a valuable thing. And you know, I think for super busy people or people who are really passionate about their work, it's often difficult to detach, even if they want to, because you know, you kind of naturally gravitate to thinking about, you know, thinking about problems that uh, that you're trying to solve. And deep play is really valuable because it offers it, it offers busy people or of an interesting alternative um, to their or to their uh, to their working lives. And for me, I realized that these kinds of evening walks have that kind of purpose for me because they are, you know, it's an opportunity both for 
a certain amount of reflection. There's also, in a place like this, a lot of interesting discovery. Um, one of the things you've got to do in workshops or interviews, you know, you listen very closely, you have to pay attention, you're responding to people, and you're kind of doing that with a place when you're out walking with a camera. And then finally, there's often a kind of autobiographical dimension to deep play. It connects to things that, you know, experiences you had uh, in your childhood or, or family things. And I realized a few years ago, actually walking around London one evening, that my dad is a history professor. And I used to go down to Brazil with him as a kid when he went to archives. We'd spend the whole day in the archives. And what would we do after that? We'd go out walking in the evening, right? And, you know, all of a sudden it hit me, I'm doing the thing that, you know, I used to do with my dad when I was eight years old. And I thought, there's something really interesting going on here. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a simple thing that turns out to be um, actually for me pretty deep. Yeah. It's interesting for me that, you know, as a doctor, uh, I see a lot of patients and, a lot of the time, people seem to get an understanding of the importance of downtime, the importance of rest after they burn out. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I don't know if it's something about the human condition where you you can hear it and you can say, oh, that's important, but I'm busy. You know, I've got a busy job. I need to keep going. But when people burn out and they suffer the consequences of it, often that's when they go, wait a minute, mm -hmm. I need to start putting some of this into my life. How did you get interested in this whole idea of deliberate rest? Well, um, you know, I've seen very much the same thing in uh, in both of uh, both of my books. No matter how smart you are, it seems um, you f learn about this stuff the hard way. You know, even Nobel Prize winners are are you know are stupid about how they you know, how they spend their time and sort of and their energy and how hard they work before they get smart and so it makes it a little easier for me to say that i did exactly the same thing right you know i was a you know i, uh, I worked as a consultant in silicon valley in sort of think tanks doing technology forecasting and futures work for about 10 years or so and kind of reached that point where it's a sort of work that's fascinating, but you're always kind of half a project behind, and it is basically impossible to catch up, right? The nature of the work is there's always, always new clients, new projects. It's difficult to know when to be, you know, when to declare yourself finished, because there's always a little bit more you can do to make something a little bit better. And especially if you're a perfectionist, um, it's that it's a it's a perfect recipe for overwork and burnout, and so you know, I found it was it seemed clear to me that you know I needed to kind of take a step back and sort of figure out how to do things differently, or it was going to get really bad. I was lucky enough to have an offer to go to uh, to go to Microsoft Cambridge for three months to have a sabbatical and to do some work uh, uh, there. And it was there that I discovered that, and I was I was working on technology and attention projects, but about halfway through, I had this realization that I was getting incredible amounts of stuff done. I was reading a lot. I was having great experiences, but I didn't feel the kind of time pressure that was just a part of like everyday life in Silicon Valley. And it made me think, you know, maybe our assumptions about the necessity of overwork, right? The you know the need to have or the constant pressure of deadlines always at your back. Maybe our assumptions that we need that in order to do really good work, that we need that as an exp that that's a natural expression of passion. Maybe that's actually completely backwards. Maybe in order to do the kind of work that we really want to do, it's necessary to pay more attention to how we rest. Um, and that actually that rest is an important part of our creative process. Not just, you know, it's obviously important for, you know, recharging our mental and or physical batteries, but 
there's an important creative dimension to it as well. And that's what got me started on the research that eventually became REST and which I followed up with Shorter. So it really does kind of flow out of my own, you know, my own kind of near miss with burnout and you know, my own just completely fortunate discovery of, you know, of the value of REST. Yeah. And you mentioned that you could always do a little bit more, make that project a little bit more finished, a little bit more complete. Uh, but there's another way of looking at that as well in the sense that I often say to patients that, look, your to-do list is never done, mm -hmm. right? Because even if you're in a meeting and you're completing something, there will be another email that rocks up whilst you're in that. So it's it's this whole idea of how do we create some borders, mm -hmm. um, which I think in many ways technology has made it harder for us. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I want to delve into Shorter, the new book, and how we can, uh, you know, you know, evolve our working practices. Um, but I think the whole idea that technology was meant to save us time, technology was meant to free us up so that actually we can do more of the things that we love. Actually, for many of us, it's had the reverse effect where instead of technology helping us, it's now enslaving us and we're sort of a prisoner to these devices that actually is making us more stressed than ever before. Yeah. You know, um, I think we've, uh, there were studies that, uh, that find that many of us interact with our phones or check our email something like 150 times a day now. And it is remarkable how in a short span of time, these have gone from, you know, sort of curiosities to being all, you know, to being like the thing that we spend we, we spend most of our attention with and the and the thing with which most many of us interact interact with sort of in the world and i think that you know it is remarkable that we have the ability to carry our you know essentially to carry our offices around in our pockets but being always but you know the capacity to be always available the the ability to answer an email instantly has moved from you know, a technical capability to a kind of social expectation not really with anyone sort of setting out to do that but that's definitely the way it's evolved you know when people first developed these devices that idea was that you would be able to break work up into chunks that you could do at different times of day as appropriate to you, but it's turned instead kind of ground work into a fine powder that now kind of settles throughout, you know, settles throughout our days. And finally, it doesn't help that, you know, Silicon Valley, you know, where I live has done an incredible job at, you know, using behavioral science to make these devices even more compelling. So, yeah, and but I think that, you know, all of this means that especially in a world where um boundaries for work don't really exist the way that they did when in you know, agricultural economies or in industrial economies when you stopped work when the sun went down or when the factory factory whistle went, you know, when we have to make the choice for ourselves about when projects are finished, when work is done for the day, it becomes, you know, it becomes more of a challenge to do so. And it becomes really easy to default to the idea that, well, we'll do just one more thing. Yeah. So, but, you know, making it, making it a choice makes it a lot harder. Look, when people ask me about stress, mm -hmm. uh, I, I've sort of written a previous book on stress, and people say, what's the biggest stressor in the modern world? And I say, of course, well, it's different for different people, but I've got to say, it's very hard for me to get away from the idea that the biggest or one of the major stresses for most of us is the fact that those boundaries between work life and home life have pretty much vanished. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think even 15 years ago, I'm going to surmise, you... In most jobs, you would have finished your work. Let's say you worked a bit late. You finished at 6 p.m., let's say. You got home. You might have had some food at home. And then you probably actually put the TV on to unwind and actually just, you know, or, or read a book or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's not uncommon uh, as soon as that's happened or during your dinner even, you'd be looking at your smartphone and actually, oh, I've got a work email. I'll, I'll just get back to after dinner. 
And it's this kind of slow, insidious, constant, um, like barrage of information that we're just constantly consuming. Mm -hmm. It is having, I think, a detrimental effect, yes, on our productivity at work, but also on our health. Mm -hmm. And, and I think this is why your work, I think, is touching on something super, super important. You started off this conversation talking about deep play. Mm -hmm. Well, when you are doing deep play, and I'd love you to define what that is as well, but when you're doing deep play, I'm guessing that actually you're probably not on your device. You're probably, by default, switching off at least through one definition of that term. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the the point about about boundaries is exactly right, you know. And one of the things that I've seen in my latest book about companies that have moved to four-day weeks is that one of the biggest benefits that uh, that these schedules deliver are clearer boundaries between work time work time and personal time, and even within the day, between the time you spend focused on work and the time you spend hanging out with your colleagues. But to get to the deep play, you know, I think one of the one of the really important features of deep play is that um, for people who are passionate about their work, for or for people who are in you know high stress jobs where it's difficult to like leave stuff behind, deep play offers a real it's important because it offers a kind of easy way to switch out of work mode, right? It's something that is just as compelling as work. And therefore, you know, you don't have to like work hard to settle your mind or, you know, and stuff. You know, you can just get right into it, which is, you know, which is really important for developing the habit and keeping it. So what is Deep Play? Deep Play's got a couple features. Paradoxically, it offers some of the same kinds of psychological rewards as work, but without the frustrations. So Winston Churchill talked about in this book, Painting as a Pastime, about how painting was great for busy people like politicians and writers, because for him, you know, painting was like politics, not, you know, not the comparison that most of us would draw, but for him, it was like politics because in both cases, you needed a clear vision of what you were going to do. You had a certain amount of time in which to act. You had to kind of strategize to figure out or of how you, you were going to create this thing. It was, but it was different because you were, you know, working in paint and outdoors rather than, you know, or with words. And it didn't have the frustrations of political life because while he was painting, he didn't have someone from the Labor Party looking over his shoulder saying, you know, those clouds are bigger and, you know, the, or if, and the tree's the wrong color. And so, and I am amazed at the number of, you know, great scientists, you know, or of neurosurgeons, CEOs, people who are in incredibly competitive, you know, ambitious fields, people who you know do world class work, who have these kinds of serious hobbies that will take them out of the lab or the C suite sometimes for you know two or three weeks at a yeah. time. But it's like the only thing that could possibly get them out. Yeah, and so I think that you know. And so as a way of you know creating creating an alternative to work that has a really clear boundary, you know, you can't think about office politics when you're 200 feet up a mountain, yeah. right? Um, as a way of provide you know providing exercise and kind of you know a different sort of cognitive exercise. Yeah, it reminds me of um, well, many people. You know, I interviewed Volta Longo on this podcast a few months ago, who's um, you know, you know, a lot of people think he may well win a Nobel Prize one day mm -hmm. for his work on fasting and what it does in the body. Um, he's a very, very accomplished musician. Right. I know many scientists who are accomplished musicians. Mm -hmm. One of my best mates who I play in a band with, he is a helicopter doctor, an A&E doctor in Chamonix in France. Mm -hmm. um, and he's an excellent bass player and an excellent ski mountaineer. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. It's not... I guess there's that perception, isn't there, that, oh, you know, I can't engage in my hobbies because I got to focus on my work so I don't have time. Right. But you could almost flip that. And I guess you would make the case that actually by focusing on those deliberate periods of passion and creativity and sport and, 
you know, deep play, mm -hmm. I guess you would make the argument that you're going to be more productive in your work as well as feel better about yourself. Yeah. You know, I think it does it does a couple really important things. You know, one is that it's a way of reminding you of what you love best about this thing. You know, when there's like office politics or when you're in projects that, you know, aren't going very well, it's, you know, it's easy for you know, your enthusiasm for work to flag and to kind of wonder, you know, what is it that I'm doing here? You know, not just with this project, like what am I doing with my life? And Deep Place serves as a way of or of helping you remember, you know, what what life and accomplishment at its best is like, right? I think another important thing is that it can serve as a kind of or of kind of creative playground in that, you know, it's a it is an opportunity for your kind of creative subconscious to keep, you know, to kind of turn over ideas, even while you're focused on something else. And we often think of this as a total, you know, th these sort of aha moments as these sort of mysterious, you know, unpredictable things. In reality, though, you know, um, like psycholog psychologists have done a fairly good job of identifying periods when these are more likely to happen. And Deep play offers a space in which your mind can turn over ideas that, you know, or that you haven't really quite worked out, but can be really important. And I mean, one great example is you know, actually the musical Hamilton, right? Lin Manuel Miranda had been working on In the Heights for like seven years, and he finally takes a vacation and he takes Ron Chernow's biography of Hamilton with him. And he says, as soon as I took a break from In the Heights, Hamilton jumped into my head. And it's, you know, and it's a fantastic example of how these breaks aren't like a competitor to work or a competitor to, you know, to good thinking, but rather are, you know, but rather our partner to it. Yeah. And I think that is such a key point, Alex, isn't it? We we're in this more is better culture where oh, there's so much to do. So the harder I work, um, the better it's going to be, the more I'm going to get done. If I work through my lunch break, you know what, I'm going to get more done. People around me are going to see that I'm working more. And mm -hmm. it's that big badge of honor in society that in some ways we need to start reframing that as, I can't remember, I think I've heard you say it before. It's, do you remember what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, that, that rest is not work's opposite, rest is work's partner. That yeah. each one, you know, each one justifies the other, supports and sustains the other. I mean, it's a bit like you know, it's a bit like it's a bit like a good marriage, right? Or of you know, or of you are different from your spouse, and yet together, you know, together you support each other. Yeah. Or of you make you make each other better and better people. Yeah. And work and rest, I think, operate in very much the same way. Yeah, I, I, I go around giving a lot of well-being talks to companies now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my top tips for them is one of the lowest tech tips that's out there, which I say, try and take a tech-free lunch break every day, mm -hmm. even if it's just for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's like, for all the fancy tech we've got, like, if you, and I explained it to them, if they understood biochemically, physiologically what happens, mm -hmm. Um, and I've, I've done it with so many people, so many patients that they come back, they're, they're more creative, they're more productive, they feel calmer, they're less stressed mm -hmm. in the afternoon, but they're also less stressed when they go home to their partner in the evening, mm -hmm. which results in improved relationships and all kinds of things. And this is why I'm such a huge fan of your work, because um, there's, there's so much synergy in what you're talking about. And I think the more people who can talk about this and raise awareness of this for people, I think the more benefits that are going to be that rest is important. Mm -hmm. It's not a substitute for um, for work. It's actually going to help you work better. Yes. Um, are you? You know, you've been banging that drum around the world for for a few years now. Do you think people are starting to get it? I think people are starting to get it. I mean, you talked about you know the 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 sort of you know the idea of overwork is a badge of honor, right? I mean, how common is that these days? But you know there are also big you know big structural things that keep us at the office that you know that command our attention, and I think one of the things that we're beginning to realize is how powerful 
like changes within organizations can be in encouraging that kind of tech free time or time for reflection you know whether it's something you know, something small like um, the imposition of no email evenings um, or whether it's something big like redesigning the entire workday right so so there are uh, so there are times when people you know can completely focus on their work without having to check their email, be distracted by Slack or or other things, and actually having tech-free lunches together where, you know, you've got, you know, where, where instead of, you know, talking with people for like two minutes around the water cooler, you actually make time to have serious conversations with, you know, with your colleagues. And that turns out to be an incredibly powerful and valuable thing, both for the happiness of individuals, but also, you know, for the performance of companies as well. And so all of this stuff turns out to be beneficial for, you know, for people's mental health, for their physical health, for their performance as, you know, as, economic agents and workers, but also as, you know, parents and partners. And it also helps, I think, families, but all, you know, and you know, companies and organizations as well. How did you start getting interested in, in this quite revolutionary idea mm -hmm. of the four-day work week? Yeah. Because, you know, I've been thinking about this uh, throughout the morning before uh, before we, we got together. Let's think about you know, Alice is having to make the case for why a four-hour, it's not a four-hour work week, a four-day <laughs> work week is so beneficial. That should be the next book. That should be the next yeah. one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think Tim Ferriss did that one what was it, uh, about 10 uh, years ago, true, the, yeah. the, the four-hour work week, uh, which is a great book, actually, because mm -hmm. for me, it's not actually about working four hours a week. It's about understanding that time is a precious commodity and how you spend that time right. is important. So that's that's what I got from that book. Um, but you're trying to make you're making a very strong case in it about why four day work weeks should be considered. Mm -hmm. But I want to flip it a little bit and go, when we're living in a culture where the World Health Organization are calling stress the health epidemic of the 21st century. When burnout uh, is, you know, going up year on year, when most people these days are feeling that just chronic state of overwhelm, instead of making the case for the four-day work week, do we almost need to make the case for the five-day work week? And actually, <laughs> you know, at what point have we proved that the way we've currently got many jobs set up and you know when have we ever proved that that's an optimum way mm -hmm. to set a workplace up for productivity or for human health mm -hmm. you know the five day work week is an artifact of the industrial 20th century right it was and it, it was something that you know, unions and reformers fought for for decades, right? The Chartists in what, the 1830s and 1840s were talking about eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for what you will. And they were actually talking, I think, about a six-day week. But, you know, the five-day week is something that gets worked out in you know, the 1900s, you know, the 1920s, and we just sort of stuck with it. And like many things, it just turns into this default that you never question. <laughs> Now, the reason that I started questioning it actually was when I was promoting rest, I would get questions along the lines of, okay, so, you know, what does a single mother do in order to get more rest, right? What tips and tricks do you have for them? And at a certain point, I realized that the answer, you know, the answer was not do this, do that. Um, certainly, the answer was not have another middle-aged guy tell you what you're doing wrong in your life. Um but rather, you know, the answer was that, look, you know, working moms, parents, and to some degree, all of us live in a world that expect us to raise kids as if we don't have careers, you know, pursue our careers as if we don't have children, to do both to some impossibly high standard, and then to put the blame on us individually when we don't live up to those standards, right? We don't need tips and tricks in order to do, to do, you know, sort of to solve these problems. 
you don't need to be super mom. What you need are structural changes that don't expect you to do both of these things simultaneously. And you know, you look at things like the problems that we have with burnout, with you know, sort of with chronic stress, you know, health issues in the workplace, depression, work-life balance. Turns out, I mean, one of the reasons I wrote this book was that the four-day week is a wonderfully elegant way of attacking all of those things at once, right? You know, whether it is mental health in the workplace, whether it's the enduring problems of flexible careers or of, you know, or of encouraging uh, encouraging and promoting women into executive positions, um, allowing parents to continue to have good careers at, once they're what once they're parents. It turns out that you know we've approached these problems with like different strategies and sort of different company yeah. policies. But um, turns out shortening the work week offers a way of dealing with all of them. And it is it, it's incredibly simple. I think it's pretty effective. And it's and it is available to a wider range of you know kinds of businesses than we might expect. And I'm seeing it unfolding in more parts of the world than you know I expected when I started working on it. Two of the countries that are uh, that have the most places that are experimenting with it are Korea and Japan, right? Places places in which overwork is such a big thing that they've invent that you know Korean and Japanese languages have their own words for working yourself to death. And that says it all, doesn't it? Exactly, <laughs> right? You know when you need. When you need to change language in order to reflect that reality, you know that you've got a serious problem on yeah. your hands. But you know, in those places, you've got companies that are as big as like a couple thousand people who have moved to you know four day weeks or six hour days, and not only has you know profitability not gone down, um, it's actually skyrocketed. These companies have done really, really well. So you're saying that by working less. Mm -hmm. Things didn't just stay still. Profits, productivity went up. Right. So this is an alien concept for many people. Yeah. How can you possibly work less, right. but gain more? Right. Um, the simple answer is that um, you know, if you look at the way in which mo in which many of us work, or many of us have to work, our days are filled with distractions, interruptions. You know poor meetings, not very good project management, crashed schedules. Once you can get a handle on those things, I mean, it turns out that stuff wastes something like two hours of productive time every day, according to some studies. So if you can get a handle on that stuff, all of a sudden you're a lot closer to being able to, you know, to do five days work in four just by like clearing away that rubble. I mean, if we think about that on a you know, on a 40 hour work week, five days a week. So if we're losing two hours a day because we're not being productive, that's 10 hours a week. That's 25% off that, you know, in inverted commas, working week where we're not really working. So, you know, I guess we could even go further back from a four day week. Potentially mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible that, and is that to do with technology? Is that to do with us getting a bit bored at work and going onto Facebook and Instagram? Or well, what is that? Um, I think yeah, technology is part of it, definitely. You know, we are, uh, the, we are being humans as distractible at work, especially if we're not working on something that's totally compelling to us. Um, I think also the fact that, you know, in a world in which we don't have such clear boundaries, it's easier to feel like, you know, you, if the school calls or if you get, you know, sort of a, you know, an email from your doctor, it's okay to deal with that at work. And sometimes, you know, it is absolutely, it really is necessary to, do, to deal with those things immediately. But the fact that you've got this kind of interference between work stuff and personal stuff means that it is, you know, that does, that does hit your productivity. Um, and then I think that, if, as most of us have experienced, lots of meetings aren't terribly well run. There were too many people in them. They kind of go on too long. And, but, you know, 
this is, but we've accepted that this is the way that meetings work. And so just by doing these relatively simple things, right, not accepting the default that the software imposes of a meeting being an hour long, but making meetings 15 or 20 minutes long, getting rid of the standing, you know, daily 9 a.m., you know, 9 a.m. thing um, that kind of doesn't start your day necessarily sort of on the, at the, you know, with the sort of highest energy. Um, using technology a little bit more mindfully and also creating times of day where it actually is okay, you know, to tell people who, you know, just have one quick question that's going to turn into 15 minutes, you know, go away, I'm going to finish this thing. All of that stuff together turns out to make it, you know, to take you a long way to being able to work more effectively, um, you know, get more done in a shorter period of time. And to allow you to do, you know, in four days what, you know, you, you used to need to do in five. I think once you start doing the maths on this with some of the statistics you're giving, I think it's probably very clear very quickly mm -hmm. that this may well be the way to go for many companies, if not all companies. Um, you know, you mentioned meetings. And, you know, my, my own career has changed quite a lot in the last few years. So I started off training to be a, a national health service doctor, mm -hmm. which is what I have done for the bulk of my time for the for most of my career. But it's pivoted in the last years, whereas I still see patients, but I'm also an author now, a podcast host. You know, mm -hmm. I, I go and speak to companies. And, you know, I love, on a personal level, what my job is now. There's a huge amount of variety, and it certainly makes me happy doing what I do. But in terms of meetings, that's something I've really reduced. Like I, I, I realized that actually a lot of people would constantly say, oh, we should get together and have a chat about things and talk about ways to collaborate. And in the past, you know, the people pleasing part of me, but like, yeah, yeah, sure. Let's go and do that. And <laughs> mm -hmm. you think, you know, you're doing all these meetings, you're not getting actually your own work done mm -hmm. and you're not actually getting any, getting anywhere. So now it's a case, of, okay, well email me with your ideas or email my PA with your ideas. And if there's something there, maybe we'll, we'll proceed on email. Um, so that's my own strategy that I've started to adopt to try and address some of this. Yeah. But on the topic of email, how much of a work suck and a productivity suck is email? <laughs> um, it, well, you know, it is now inextricable with most of our work. So going to zero is sort of, uh, is, impossible for most of us. Yeah. But, you know, just the amount of time, let's just take two things. I and mean, one is um, the amount of time that is lost to the distraction of email, even if, even if it's an important message, right? Once you get into flow working on something, you get interrupted by a message and just reading it will, uh, or if, take you out of what you were doing. And it can take a good 15 minutes or so to get back into that state where you're really focused again on something. Now, we are interrupted by email or other things on an average of 11 minutes. And so it's, you know, you want... I thought we it'd all, be more, you know. I no, thought it'd be yeah, more. But, you know, we all have that experience of ending the day and wondering, what did I get done? And part of the reason that, you know, we have these days is that we have these, you know, this constant barrage of interruption that unless, once again, you make a conscious choice about setting boundaries around, can really destroy your attention and destroy your day. But I think, you know, the other important, you know, I think the other important thing that, you know, your experience uh, suggests and that, uh, and that I see in the book is that there's a really important like social dimension to these issues. We often think of attention and focus, distraction as things that happen between like our eyes and brains and a screen. But, you know, my capacity to focus at work depends on other people's ability to respect my attention, right? And our ability all together to work in ways that let us really be effective. It's a bit like, you know, going to the movie theater and, you know, you have this, you know, everybody has this thing that we're supposed to pay attention to, not our phones, certainly not phone conversations. And you, you know, you work together so that you can focus on, you know, focus on what's happening, you know, happening 
sort of up on stage. And I think being able, you know, recognizing that there is this important social dimension to all of these things is you know, one of the keys, I think, to sort of dealing with them really effectively. I love the way that you're pitching this as a societal and structural issue because I think it really takes the pressure off the individual. I mean, you touched on that already. You know, it's not not necessarily what can I do individually to get more deep play in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, although that can, of course, have some merit. Yeah. But really, what you're talking about is restructuring society, and it's hard for me not to fast forward a few years and think, well. The research you present in Shorter is really compelling. The stories are really compelling. Is I mean, do you anticipate a point in the near future where you can almost say companies have a moral responsibility to implement working practices like the four-day work week for the health of their employees, for the health of the country, for the you know social cohesion? but also on a business level so that they can be more productive. Mm -hmm. You know, I think whether they do it for business reasons or for moral reasons, they see benefits, right? Um, these companies talk about you know, sort of work-life balance scores going way up. You know, people, uh, people are healthier because they have more time to do things like, you know, whether it's go to the doctor or train for a marathon or go to the gym. Um, they also are healthier because they have more time with their families. And of course, you know, we all know that, you know, time with other people is an important thing in keeping us, keeping us sane, but also keeping us physically healthy. And so I think that the, uh, I mean, I love the idea that there is, you know, that in a sense, we should treat, we should treat attention we should treat kind of mental health in the same way that we are that companies are now learning to treat you know environmental concerns right as something that is important yes it's important order for economic reasons but it's also you know important for moral reasons as well i would love to get to that point and i think probably sooner rather than later we will you know when you start thinking about it and when you come at it from that position, I think thinking of you know, thinking of organizations, thinking of workplaces as places that can do good things for people's health, that can be redesigned in ways to make them healthier, you know, and not just about adding plants or healthy snacks, which you know are great things, and which actually a bunch of these companies do, but you know, redesigning the way in which people work so that people can be healthier is. If there were clear, there would be tremendous public health benefits to that. It sounds like it's a philosophy that's more in tune with the population of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, you know, we read lots of these articles that millennials are now seeking jobs that give them purpose and mm -hmm. passion rather than just what's the salary going to be like, what's the career progression going to be like, which is certainly a change from 20, 30 years ago in mm -hmm. terms of how a lot of people would choose their jobs. And I guess a natural consequence of that might be um, if we're trying to do a job that we're passionate about, that's going to make an impact on the world, well, we can't do that if we're burning out and actually we've got no time to enjoy the benefits of a happier, healthier society. So it kind of feels as though this is a movement that could very rapidly grow, particularly with great books like yours, <laughs> to contribute to that conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, have you seen particular types of works, um, particular types of companies more receptive than others to this kind of thinking? I have been impressed at the range of industries in which um, the four-day week has been implemented. I mean, it, it literally is everything from software startups to car dealerships to repair shops to um, there's a steel maker in um, in Birmingham who makes balti bowls that works, you know, a four-day week now. And so, you know, it's not just like it's not just creatives. It's also not industries where you know, people are looking for a totally laid back lifestyle. You know, no one goes into software because it's going to be, you know, an easy life. Yeah. 
And I mean, I think that what they do all share are people at the top who really feel the necessity of this, right? Who, you know, have had that experience, you know, that brush with burnout that we talked about yeah. earlier. Um, having people, having a workforce that is willing to take a kind of growth mindset to be kind of experimental, um, who often maybe are themselves parents and have enough experience yeah. in their jobs to be able to say, you know, we've been doing it this way for the last 10 years. Here's how we can do it better, right? Here's what's broken in the system. Yeah. And I know enough now so that I think I can fix it. When you've got those things, it, you know, everything else becomes just a matter of like scheduling and logistics, whether you are, you know, whether you're creatives, whether you're making things, whether you're salaried or hourly. Um, I think that, you know, or if kind of culture is upstream of all of this. Yeah. There's lots of employers who listen to this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned car dealers. Mm -hmm. I know there's one very, very large car, car dealer in the UK whose uh, boss and team listens to this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also many HR departments who listen. And for those of them who I think, okay, all right, I like what you're saying, Alex. I can see the benefits. But I've got no clue where to start. How would I bring that into my workplace? Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? You know, so for offices, um, the first place to start is meetings, right? Every, you know, nobody loves meetings. Uh, generally, in most places, meetings aren't aren't terribly well run, and so getting a handle on them, making them shorter is a way both of clearing out a bunch of time in the sort of in people's schedules. It's also a way of um it's an easy win because it fixes an enduring problem that everyone is aware of and yet tends tends to go unrepaired. It also then sets up the question, all right, if we can fix this, what else can we fix? Right? Sort of you know, you've lived with you've lived with bad meetings your entire career, and yet if it turns out in a few weeks that you can get control of them, maybe there's other stuff that you can deal with. And then finally, the other important thing is the social dimension, right? You know, you get twenty people in a meeting for an hour. That's tw you know that's twenty person hours. That's like you know, half a week of one person's time. It's really easy to underestimate, you know, just how many human hours get absorbed in meetings. And once you, until you start to reduce them and you, and, and you realize, good heavens, you know, every meeting turns out to be really expensive. And I think what you're talking about is, I know we touched on this with um, Tim Ferriss's book before, mm -hmm. um, but it's all coming back to this idea that time is a precious commodity. Mm -hmm. It's a non-renewable commodity. What do we use that time for? We ain't getting it back right. when it's gone. And I guess, you know, in essence, your argument is also that if you're working, work. Mm -hmm. Be productive at that work. And when you're resting, rest. Yeah. But don't try and mix and match it all because then you don't do either one particularly well. Right. You know, one of the things in both rest and shorter um, that I learned from the people I studied and talked to is that focused periods of intensive work beat long semi-distracted hours every time. Yeah. Right? You know, you can get more done in four hours where no one bothers you than you can in 12 where... You know, you're kind of switching in and out I mean, and dealing with different things. 100%. And um, I'm interested to you how that played out as an author. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll share with you how it plays out with me as an author. So when you're writing, mm -hmm. how do you get your writing done? Because that's not your only job, is it? You do other things as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I get up super early. So when I'm working on a book, I'm up generally by about five or so. Put in a couple hours, take out the dogs, come back, write some more. And usually in that walk, I'm turning over ideas and I I realize, wait, you know, if I do this, do this transition this way, it solves this problem, right? So that's a kind of creative time for me. By about nine or ten or so, the biggest part of the writing day for me is done. And you know, 
And I do this even though I am absolutely not a morning person, right? I am someone who in college started homework like at 10 o'clock at night all the time. And But you know, when you've got kids, when you've got a job- um, Do you have kids? I do. I have two. Um, one's in college, one's about to go off. Okay. So, and, but- you know, when you've got those kinds of demands and when you've got, you know, the constant lore of Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and other stuff, um, you got to find a time when, when you can work undisturbed. And for me, the super early hours are valuable partly because no one else is up. If I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to do this to myself, I'm not going to waste time like on social media. Yeah. I'm actually going to do something with that time. And, you know, and then the rest of the day, I do everything else I talk about in rest. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of naps. You know, I walk a lot. Um, and doing all those things, I've been, a, you know, my first, my first academic book took 10 years to write. <laughs> Doing all the, you know, and I was like, you know, you know, in that kind of constant state of sort of overload and, you know, thinking that, you know, this was simply the way that unruly genius operated, right? Working the way that I describe in rest in this, in 10 years, I've been able to finish three books. Yeah. With, I think the results speak for themselves. Yeah. A hundred percent. I can't say that's how many of the things you do are the things that I do, particularly when writing. So, mm -hmm. Uh, like you, I'm juggling many things. Mm -hmm. Two young kids, one are a bit younger than yours, nine and seven at the moment. Um, you know, seeing patients, uh, all kinds of other things that I've got going on, like many people do these days. Right. I'm not saying I'm right. particularly unique. Everyone feels that they're busy and they've got lots and lots of different things to do. When I am writing, when I'm in those months where actually I know I need to write and I need to deliver something, I wake up early. Now, I wake up early most days anyway. I am a morning person. I'll sometimes go to 4.30 when I'm writing. Wow. Um, but I know if I get a half four till half eight window in of writing or a 5 a.m. till 9 a.m. writing, I get so much more done then than if I started, let's say, at 9, 9 a.m. and I tried to sort of plow through for the entire day, I never, ever beat three or four hours of intense work in the morning. And so when I'm in writing mode and, and I've, you know, having, you know, written three books in three years, I've, I've really had to refine my process so that I can actually spend time with my family, mm -hmm. you know, spend the time seeing my patients, you know, spend time on myself, on my own hobbies. I've had to get really good at how I use time. And I know that that morning time for me is peak creativity. I just don't want to be contacted in the day by many people. So I try not to go on email. I try not to talk to people who help me in my team or anything because it's I know that I need to you know protect my mental space so that I can deliver what I'm trying to do at the moment right and I I guess you know not everyone listening to this as an author but they will have something in their life that's important to get done mm -hmm. and I guess what you're also saying or, or the follow-on sort of idea from your work is that we got to find out what works for us on an individual level, as well as a structural level. We've got to find, trying to figure out actually when when are we particularly good at working? When are we good at just sort of closing things off yeah. and not doing any work? It's yeah, it's. I think it has real real value. This. Mm -hmm. No, I think that you know, for me, it took two or three weeks, right, to really understand how mornings work. And I have certain practices, right? And one important one is actually I set up everything I possibly can the night before. Okay. Because I don't want to have to make a single decision at five in the morning, like what to wear, you know, or of what I'm going to work on. So the night before, I will outline the writing tasks for the next day. You know, I set up breakfast. I set out the clothes that I'm going to wear. And so I can just operate on automatic until the time when I flip up the screen and I start work. The great thing about that is that, you know, I'm not spending any energy making decisions other than what the next words are. Yeah. It's also important because it's a sort of sort of self-blackmail. Right, you know, if I'm going to go to the work the night before of setting stuff up, I'm a lot less likely to rationalize like sleeping in. Right, I'm kind of making my future self sort of commit to this, and also, you know, when you do that, um, really interestingly, setting up 
setting up questions that you sleep on makes it more likely that you'll actually answer them. You know, you're kind of your mind turns things over even while you're asleep. John Cleese had a wonderful line about how when he first started, you know, writing comedy sketches, that he would get stuck on something at night and he'd go to sleep and the next morning, not only would he have the answer, he couldn't even remember why he was stuck. Yeah. And that, you know, it sounds mysterious, but you give your mind practice, you let it work on this, and it learns how to do it. And it is you know, it is utterly miraculous. Yeah, there's, there's. I know you, you, you're a neuroscientist as well, mm-hmm. um, and I can't remember what that state of consciousness is called. Just as you're falling to sleep, right? Um, but a I have magogic state, exactly. Yeah, and well, why don't you tell us about that? So I mean, it's it's essentially you know those moments in between um, in between wakefulness and sleep where you know you are. It's those moments when you know you're uh, often. Um, you're, it's a little bit like dreaming, yeah. except you're often, or of dealing with, st- you're, you're, th- you're sometimes thinking about stuff that, you know, you're kind of turning over things from the day or thinking about ideas or problems. And every now and then in those states, you know, we have these experiences of, you know, having ideas come to mind yeah. and it's, you know, it's a, it's an illustration of how, you know, how our creative, our kind of creative minds are capable of doing things kind of without our conscious effort and, and without yeah. our force. And, you know, one of the great things with deliberate rest that deliberate rest offers is a space for your kind of creative subconscious to work on problems that have eluded your own solution. And whether it's, you know, little things like how to handle these paragraph transitions or sometimes some very big ideas. Yeah, you know, people. There were you know, some famous cases of mathematicians and scientists, you know, working for years on problems, getting stuck, you know, putting them down, and then a few weeks later, while they're on a, you know, sort of at the beach or about to get on a train, all of a sudden the answer comes to you know comes to their mind. When you give your brain the downtime, precisely, not when you're constantly going, trying to be productive, working more. Exactly. You know, and how valuable is that? If you are in a creative industry, if you're a leader who has to be thinking about next year's products, who has to be, you know, trying to make sense of global trends, you know, thinking about you know, what while you know what things just over the horizon could be a real opportunity or a real problem, it's really difficult to think about that stuff just when you're at your desk dealing with you know the everyday and answering emails. One of the great you know, and being able to do stuff like get out on your bike or work in the garden on that, you know, maybe that fifth day yeah. is amazingly valuable for these company leaders and for the and for the people who work for them. Yeah. I mean, I love that idea of you know, mulling things over at night so you wake up with the solution. And mm-hmm. it's something that I very much try and do in my own life. I'm very, I'm very um, attentive to what I'm doing in those 10 or 20 minutes just before I fall asleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, I often recommend to people, I think one of the worst things you can do is watch the news before you go to bed. Um, <laughs> I think you wake up full of anxieties and worries that often impacts your sleep. I think for me, if yeah. I'm trying to solve a problem, again, you've got to be careful. You don't want it to be too stimulating, whereby right. actually it stops you from sleeping. But if there's a few ideas I'm mulling around, I'll often think about them or read about them just before I go to bed mm-hmm. and set myself up for that morning burst of creativity. Exactly. Um, you know, one of the other things that I do is stop writing in mid-sentence because you know I don't reach the end of a section or you know even the end of a paragraph. Because partly... It is, you know, it's easier. It's easier to start writing if you don't have the existential terror of the blank page facing you. Yeah. As a writing exercise, picking up where you left off just makes things a little bit easier. But it also means f- that your mind continues working on the rest of that paragraph and then the next one and the next one, even while you know you are thinking about other things. So you, so you leave it unfinished so that your brain's trying to complete it a little bit and actually 
Yeah, I like that. Exactly. And there were and and you know, I cannot I cannot take credit for this or if, you know, Stephen King and Ernest Hemingway talk about doing this. Yeah. So, um, but you know, worked for them. Worked for them, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, if we delve into the neuroscience a little bit of deliberate arrest, mm-hmm. I mean, what happens when we, you know, are switching off and are fully immersed in that passion, you know, right. going for a hike or playing a musical instrument or going for a walk. What, what is going on mm-hmm. in our brains that gives us all these benefits? Right. You know, um, there's been a bunch of work in the last 20 years in neuroscience and the psychology of creativity that's helped open up our understanding of, or of what's going on in the creative mind. In particular, in those periods where it feels like we're not in conscious control of, or of, of these processes or when our attention is elsewhere. So... The first thing is that you know, when you kind of switch off your attention, it sort of feels like your brain sort of shuts down, but it actually doesn't, right? You know, your brain is actually every bit as active as it is when you are thinking hard about something. It's just that sort of the, the connectome, the parts of the brain that are talking to each other are different. And in particular, the parts of the brain that are associated with more creative activity as opposed to kind of just straight on problem solving, um, are or of are, are more connected and more active. So, you know, in a sense, what the brain does is switch into a mode where it's ready to solve problems on your behalf. Now, sometimes we have the a kind of low level experience of this brain working on our behalf almost every day, right? You know, when you think. You know, when you're trying to remember who was the musician who was in that band and then had that single, and you can't remember who they were, and then five minutes later, you're doing the dishes, and all of a sudden, they come to mind. That's the default mode network. That's those those brain connections oper- continuing to work on that problem, even while you've gone on to do something else. Now, in the daily schedules of highly creative people, what you see them doing is layering periods of really intensive work with pe- with these periods of deliberate rest. These activities like walking or gardening or you know going for a swim or other activities that are not very cognitively demanding, but which you know get them out of the office and which give their creative minds time to keep working, to keep turning over these you know problems that they were just thinking about, thinking hard about 30 minutes ago. And when you kind of load up your creative mind with that sort of with those, with those outstanding problems, it kind of likes to keep working on them. And if it has the space to do so at the end of that, you know, by the end of that swim or that hike, it's likely to have made some progress. And, you know, I think that, you know, we think of because we think of creative work and other kinds of work as involving willpower, you know, expenditure of effort, we tend to shortchange how powerful that other part of our brains can be, other part of our minds. But if we give them, give it the space to operate, if we practice deliberate rest, not only do we recover the energy that we spend in those highly intensive focus periods, when you can actually get, you know, there's plenty of substantive stuff that you can get done when you're, you know, when you're concentrating. There's no question about that. But there's also creative stuff that you can come up with that you might never, if you didn't take that time, if you didn't have that practice. And so, you know, that's that, you know, that for me, for, you know, someone who loves writing, who loves, you know, solving the problems that, you know, that, uh, that writing books involves, you know, having, having the practice that sort of helps me, you know, helps me create, create better work that helps me see the world a little better is, you know, that's like, that's worth organizing my entire day yeah. and a lot of my life around. Yeah, it's it's this whole cultural idea that more is better. Doing, doing, doing is what gets you ahead. Mm-hmm. Whereas we're really seeing this resurgence, aren't we, in terms of 
the importance of sleep, mm -hmm. the importance of rest, and the importance of deep play. You know, really starting to understand, I think, um, more and more, it needs to get out there much more than it currently is, but little by little, trying to get the idea out there that actually less can be more. Right. Um, that actually not doing something can be beneficial, can have multiple benefits. Rather than looking at what you're missing out on, mm -hmm. we need to start framing it as what we're gaining from doing that. But I, I do wonder whether there is a big education piece here that needs to happen societally. And the example that comes to mind for me is in the recent general election in the UK, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, Jeremy Corbyn, who was um, the opposition leader, he or his department or his party at some point, I think, had um, hypothesized that public sector workers at some point in the future would move to four-day weeks or they were looking into it. Mm -hmm. And I was super interested by that. But he was actually belittled in the media by, by many people in the media saying, oh, this is just more ri ri ridiculous. And I'm not, well, I'm not making a political argument either way. Right. I'm simply saying that I think that that whole idea as a concept is one that has value and it's one that we should be looking at seriously, uh, individually on a company level, but also politically in terms of how we structure our working systems. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see it get any traction because people thought it was another reason to sort of hammer him down with. Right. And I think, does this whole idea have a bit of a PR problem? Does it need, I know you're addressing that with your book, mm -hmm. but do we need to really get the messages in your book out there to politicians, to policymakers to say, look, there is a strong case here for doing this. This is not slacking off. This is actually going to be beneficial for the economy. Right. You know, um, the, I think with the, you know, the last election, the opposition was really effective at hammering, hammering the idea that the four day week was, you know, was going to require another money tree that, yeah. you know, and that it basically was another giveaway. And, but if you look at the companies that are doing it, you know, it's a very different kind of proposition, right? It is, you know, it's not about working less. It's, you know, it's, it, it's not a way, you know, it's not a way of punishing capitalists. Yeah. Um, it is a way of making businesses more productive, more sustainable and making people happier. You know, I think that if you were, if you were making the case to shareholders or to investors, you know, I think you would, uh, who were you know, reluctant and who were so accustomed to the idea that you make more money by making people work longer hours or by, you know, reducing what Walmart calls time theft, you know, stuff like going to the bathroom. Time theft. Time theft. Yes. Is that what is that where yes. we've got to? It's not <laughs> yes. Not working is time theft. Right? Think about think about what that means for the way, you know, you think about how life should be lived and how time should be spent. But, you know, I think the sort of the way that you would uh, I think the way to uh, to make the larger argument is first of all that the shorter work week has demonstrated benefits in terms of recruitment and retention, productivity and profitability, work-life balance, and talent development. If you can tell me which one of those things you don't like as an investor or a shareholder, we can talk about making adjustments. But I think, you know, once you see the numbers that most, you know, most people who pride themselves on making, you know, smart investment decisions or being rational economic actors will see, yeah, it looks counterintuitive at first, but because you do all these other things in order to make the four-day week work, yeah, all right, this makes sense. At another level, I think that the, you know, one of the, there is a kind of cultural change that these companies have to go through in thinking, in moving away from the idea that overwork is like, a sign of productivity or it's a sign of virtue. As one and these are, you know, these are all companies where long hours are the norm, right? In the restaurant industry, people work, you know, 15 hour days for weeks on end. These are cultures where you know, overwork as a mark of virtue, as a kind of necessary step for success, is just like built into the DNA of these professions. And 
one of you know this one of the founders put it it took us a while to get to the point where you know, we realized actually anyone can sit in a chair for 12 hours a day that's not the hard thing the hard thing is the impressive thing is being able to do your work in 6 hours and you know, and knock it out and get out of there that you know for so long we've treated we've treated long hours as a kind of proxy for commitment as a proxy for dedication for passion for productivity and it turns out so these companies show that that is you know that's exactly backwards yeah. the people who are really good at their jobs are not the people who need huge amounts of time to do them they're people who are capable of really focusing in on what's important on identifying yeah. you know sort of the key parts of the problem the sort of you know the most effective way to solve them and then actually go about doing that that's you know that's what we should value that's what these companies value yeah and that you've got loads of really nice cases in the book about companies i think there's one that's a restaurant actually which did make that change yeah. and managed to do it yes but one thing i just wanted to think about is is there a danger that if a company moves to a four day work week that they push their employees really, really hard on those days. Say, yeah, you can have your time off, but I'm going to work you into the ground for those six hours a day whilst you are there. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any evidence of that at all? Um, it is a more intense day, definitely. But I think that, um, and there are stories of, you know, one or two people at a company who will quit rather than make the changes that they need to in order to, uh, to, you know, to uh, to make that work for them, but I think the you know, the the two things that kind of counterbalance that intensity are first off the fact that in all of these companies, the workers themselves figure out how to make the four day week work. Right, the change starts at the top. You need a right now. You need a founder or a CEO who says we're going to do this and. You know, we're going to do these experiments. Some of these things are going to fail, but we're going to figure it out. But nobody at the top knows everyone's job well enough to figure out which parts they can take out, which parts you can automate, which parts you know, are actually incredibly valuable that you want to be able to preserve for yourself and focus on. So the actual kind of redesign of the work is done by people themselves. And most people turn out to be fairly good judges of, you know, of or of what they need to do, you know, where they need to focus. The other thing is that um, you know, that one of the reasons you give people an extra day off, or you know, you close the office at three if you're doing a six-hour day, is that yeah, the work is more tiring, but. It's more tiring in the way that you know finishing a marathon is tiring as opposed to being in you know unproductive meet you know yeah. unproductive frustrating meetings for yeah. ten hours is tiring. Both of those you know both of those things take a lot of energy, but you feel really really different at the end yeah, of it's, them. It's productive fatigue. Exactly. I guess. Yeah. Yes. So you know I think that um, you know so at least you know so far. Um, the uh, the indicator is that yeah people actually you know you do work harder it's a little more like high intensity training um you know in the gym but you know it turns out that the set that you know the extra recovery time um the feeling that you are more in control of your own job that you have more time to work effectively even though you're working fewer days and there were uh, a couple companies have uh, have done surveys where they ask people, "Do you have enough time to do to do your work?" And actually, the percentage of people who say yes goes up when they go to four day weeks, which yeah, an extraordinary thing, right? It's an it's a great it's a beautiful indicator of the subjectivity of time, but also how much time normal companies turn out to waste. All and I think the fact that you know you are doing this with other people, right? You're having the experience, often sometimes fairly intense experience, of you know, all of you redesigning the work so that you can all share this yeah. common benefit. You know, 
that's hard, but it's worthwhile hard. Yeah, and that has extra benefits, doesn't it? You know, it's something we've spoken about on this podcast many times before about how important that human social connection is. Yeah. How important it is to feel as though you've got some control over how your life, how your day goes down. Exactly. Which is what you're sort of suggesting. If come if if someone senior at a company says, okay, let's try and do this, and then actually includes the team and say, hey, what are you guys finding productive? Mm -hmm. What do you think is a bit of a time suck? You know, and the more people who are invested in that together, the the better you feel individually, but also collectively. Yeah. You know, um, one founder said that, you know, all of my employees now act like they own the company, and all I did was give them a day off. It's an, you know, that is, as a company owner, that is exactly how you want people it's, to behave. I mean, it's win, win, win all around this, yeah. isn't it? It's it just is. a case of persuading people to give it a go. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, we could go into the weeds on every single industry. Of course, some industries might find it more challenging than others. But I don't know, fundamentally, you're talking about how do you do productive work when you're working? Mm -hmm. And how do you sort of balance that with doing productive resting when you're resting? I've already said it, but it really is that profound for me that that's what we're fundamentally talking about. Mm -hmm. But Alice, what would you say, you know, you talk about companies, many people are self-employed these days. Right. So if there's a freelancer or someone self-employed listening to this right now who likes your ideas mm -hmm. and buys into them and goes, yeah, I can see that. Can you give them any tips on what they can apply from this kind of systemic structural change in a company, mm -hmm. but what they can do individually as a freelancer? Okay. You know, I think one thing is recognize that these problems aren't individual ones, right? That they are collective ones. And that, you know, your every change we make in terms of uh, being more mindful of our attention, of how we use technology – of you know, uh, how we how we run meetings is a potential gift to someone else. These companies, you know, all of them worry at the beginning that clients are going to hate this, and it turns out clients are universally supportive because they are solving problems that the clients also have. Yeah. Right. You know, if and it's one thing to hear about someplace in Sweden doing it, but if it's a company that you know you've worked with for years that understands your culture and you understand, then the lessons from there feel like they're a little more transferable. But to get back to what individuals can do, I mean, I think that you know recognizing recognizing that that social dimension is one thing, but I think that on a daily basis, you know, if there is one. If there's one serious place in which to begin, I think it's recognizing that you know that work and rest are not competitors, but rather they are partners for all of the reasons that that we've talked about, and that structuring a day in which you start with you know your biggest, most significant tasks, right? You clear away time in your schedule to work uninterrupted on that, kind of creates us not only helps you be more productive it also creates a space for rest there's this great you know the saying in the US marine corps you know the rest you get is the rest you earn right you know when you're when you're when you're training you've got a certain amount of time to complete a task and then a you know a finite amount of time before the next task starts the fast you know the fa so the faster you can get through one challenge the more time you have to sleep before the next one and I think for all of us, one of the ways to justify getting more rest is structuring our days so that if you get what you know, if you get some of that big stuff done first, it's a lot easier to say, yeah, I can take a nap or, you know, I can take that walk. I think recognizing that layering that kind of focused work and deliberate rest also has creative benefits as well as health benefits is you know is a good thing for order of solo performers and then i think finally you know recognizing how uh, you know how much technology is both woven into our daily work and can absorb and direct our time and direct our attention 
if we do not consciously manage those things ourselves, is you know, the other great challenge for knowledge workers in the 21st century. Right? These devices do a fantastic job of making choices for us when we don't make them ourselves. And they generally don't make choices on our behalf yet. Right? They make them on the behalf of their makers or advertisers or, you know, or of companies who are interested in us as data. And so, you know, taking control, taking control of our kind of digital lives and our device lives is the other really essential thing yeah. I think that you do in order to carve out space both for better work and for better rest. One of the biggest sources of distraction is our smartphones. So what is your best tip for mm. how we can better manage our smartphones? Okay. You know, um, in their sort of default state, smartphones are like toddlers. You know, every they're, everything is equally interesting. They want to share stuff with you right now. And if you don't respond to them, it's a disaster. And so, you know, I think of it as, you know, let's, let's help our smartphones grow up a little bit. Let's let them be a little more thoughtful about when they demand our attention and help them understand what we consider to be important. And so what I've done is, you know, I turn off all the notifications for news and other things or of, yeah. uh, just completely zero that out. And then for phone calls and for texts, I follow something that I call the zombie apocalypse test, which is in the zombie apocalypse, who do you need to be able to call? And for me, it is basic, you know, it's immediate family, right? My wife, my kids, a couple other people. And those people, I give one ringtone, which is the opening bars of Derek and the Dominoes' Layla. Oh, yeah. Like because it. no matter where I am, no matter what's going on, what background noise there is, that's going to cut through. I'm going to hear that. And I'm, I'm going to know, oh, it's my wife or my kids. Everybody else in my contacts list and the world at large gets the opening bars of a Yo-Yo Ma solo Bach cello concerto. Because that kind of, you know, if it, if it comes on while I'm doing something, it's easy to ignore. It's easy to make, basically, it's easy to make a decision about whether I want to shift my attention to the phone or whether I want to keep working on this other thing. And so I think that, you know, by doing that, my phone goes from being something whose purpose is to interrupt me according to you know, whatever rules it wants or according to someone else's preferences. And it becomes a little bit more like, you know, an assistant who, you know, who knows who you're going to want to hear from, you know, who knows if you're in the middle of a meeting, they should interrupt you. Yeah. Um, and knows how to say no to everybody else. So that's so you know. Turn off notifications. Think about the zombie apocalypse test. Choose the piece of music that you're that you know is going to cut through everything, and you know have a happier life. Oh, I love it. I love it. And you're using technology and you're, you know, you're sort of playing with it a little bit to make it work for you rather than work right. against you. Um, Alex, that's a brilliant tip. I think a lot of people could do with uh, applying those in their own life. I'm, I don't have a different ringtone. That's interesting. Uh, something I could possibly put in uh, to my life. Although I've got to say my phone is often on silent. So I, I miss calls all the time. That's, <laughs> that's the other strategy. Um, but Alex, look, uh, this podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in our lives, we get more out of them. Out of all the research you've done, out of all the books you've written, what is your one tip that my listeners can start applying into their everyday lives to improve the way that they feel? The simplest things that I would suggest would be that um, everyone should take their evenings and their weekends more seriously, by which I mean, you know, take them as yours. If there's a, you know, that the research tells us that you know, whether you are in a creative field or in you know, a high intensity occupation, that, you know, 
you are less likely to burn out, you are more likely to have a happy life, and more likely to be you know, better at home and at work. If you are able to detach from work when you're off the job. Um, and I think that you know, it is you know, it is fashionable these days to think about work and the boundaries between work and life having dissolved as a kind of cool thing. There actually is a use to those boundaries, and I think that sort of uh, that recall that appreciating their value and um, or, uh, and respecting them when we are both when we are at work and just as importantly when we're out is you know, it turns out to have you know, benefits for us both in the immediate term and in the long run you know over the course of decades if you you know if you take your vacations if you have a hobby that interests you that engages you on the weekends you know not only you know you're you're likely later in life to be healthier you know, you're more, you're less likely to have chronic illnesses, dementia. You, know, you will be, you will be more likely to be the person you want to be um, than you know if you if you over you know if you overwork, if you allow email to be the last thing you see at night and the first thing that you see in the morning. Um, just having those boundaries. And allowing yourself to have that time is the simplest thing I think that we can do, and in some ways, the single most powerful thing that we can do. Yeah, Alex, I love that. Um, thank you so much for sparing some of your time today. I wish you all the best for the rest of your time in London. We're actually both speaking on the same stage tomorrow oh, at Life Lessons at the terrific. Barbican. So I think I'm on just before you. So uh -huh. we will no doubt see each other in the green room tomorrow at the Barbican. But Alex, you've written some great books. Um, I really would recommend them to people listening to this or watching this on YouTube. Thank you so much. And hopefully we can continue this conversation at some point in the future. Great. Now, this has been a real pleasure. So thanks very much. Press subscribe to get more inspiration and ideas on how to feel better so you can get more out of life. And if you have a moment, why not check out this conversation that I've picked out as a perfect follow-up. Remember, lifestyle change is always worth it because when you feel better, you live more.